Thank you for the invitation. It will be about subgraphs of diameter one in graphs of gear two. And this will be about uh, joint work with uh, Damian Osaida and Sergei Nori Norin. With Damian Osaida and Sergei Norin. So let's first uh, say what graphs are. So a graph for us is a metric graph, so a metric space, metric graph that uh, contains uh, vertices and edges. It might be infinite, but we require that the possible edge lengths are finite. So with finitely many possible edge lengths. And let me say what the girth of a graph is. So once you have a graph, its girth is the length of shortest cycle. The length of the shortest cycle where the cycle is just an embedded closed path, closed edge path in the graph. We start uh, with an exercise from a uh, book of Brown. So suppose we have a graph, gamma, let gamma uh, be a graph with all vertices of degree at least three, with all vertices of degree at least three. And then if gamma does not have short cycles, so if gamma has gear two, but is pretty small and diameter one, uh, then there is an integer Uh, k such that every edge of gamma has length precisely 1 over k. In fact, the exercise is more specific. Uh, you're supposed to prove that such a graph is a building uh, or uh, if you know it under a different name, the incidence uh, a graph of a, uh, of a generalized polygon. So I will leave you with this exercise. Uh, there are many elementary ways you can prove it. I'll just maybe show you some examples. So first example would be a complete bipartite graph. So you take a bunch of uh, vertices that are colored blue, a bunch of vertices that are colored red, connect all of them, and uh, specify that each green edge has length a half, and now Hopefully you see that the shortest cycles have length two and that this graph has diameter one. So that's uh, one example of such a graph. And uh, another example would be the incidence graph uh, of projective planes.
and they've prepared an advanced figure. So again, you have a bunch of vertices that are red, a bunch of vertices that are blue. You require that each edge now has length a third. The, only, the shortest cycles are hexagons, so they have uh, length exactly two, and a shortest path between uh, any um, uh, two vertices is at most of uh, combinatorial length three, so metrically one. So these are examples of uh, graphs to which this exercise applies. And uh, maybe to give one more definition before I state our main theorem is to specify what, I, what will I call a segment in a graph. So a segment uh, of a graph Lambda is an edge path uh, with endpoints of degree at least three, and all internal vertices and all internal vertices of this path of degree two. So you have some point of degree three, some edge path terminating at a point uh, again of degree three, and all the vertices of this edge path have uh, degree two. So this kind of path will be called a segment. Any questions up to this point? So now I will state uh, a theorem that we came across doing a group theory, but since I was not supposed to talk about groups, I will talk about this uh, theorem that surprisingly showed up on the way. So it's from our paper with Sergei and Damian. that we posted in 2011. And the proof is basically due to Sergei. So it's a generalization of that exercise. Again, we have a graph of gear th, uh, two. So let gamma be a graph and let lambda in gamma be a finite subgraph. And assume that this subgraph has all vertices of degree at least two, with all vertices of degree at least two. And then, again, once we have this interplay between diameter and girth, so if gamma has girth two, and it's now the subgraph lambda that's required to have small diameter, and lambda has diameter one as a subgraph of gamma, diameter one in gamma, then, all cycles and segments of lambda and segments of lambda have rational length, have rational length.
I will show in a moment an example that shows that you exit the class of uh, buildings that we just discussed. So let me do one example. So let's start with the subgraph with lambda. So lambda will be an octagon, all of whose edges have length a third. And now to complete lambda to gamma, I will draw these uh, long uh, diagonals. They will have length two thirds. This one, this one, this one, and that one. All these red diagonals have length uh, two thirds. So as you can see here, the, even though this uh, cy green cycle lambda is uh, long, these uh, diagonals show that uh, its diameter inside gamma is uh, one, because for example, to get from this point to this point, now you can employ the uh, diagonal. Uh, but still, the, the girth of the large uh, graph is uh, not, so, not, not so small. The shortest uh, cycles here have uh, uh, length two. So this is an example where now you can compute the cycles in lambda. Actually, lambda is a single cycle. And if you compute the length, you will have that the length of lambda is 8 thirds. That's rational. So that's an example that our theorem might work. Any questions? Yeah, so that's the reason why I assume that, uh, that I only measure the length of segments, not edges, but segments. So for example, if I subdivide my edge irrationally, I, I don't count the length of this edge. I just count the length either of the entire cycle or a segment joining points of degree at least three. More questions? Yes. And the girth is two? Yes. And the diameter is one? Of the subgraph. Yeah, of the subgraph. For, because the diameter of the large graph is not one. If you take the midpoint, ah. uh, if you take, uh, I think, point here, maybe, and point here, and to go from here to here, you have to go uh, uh, almost, uh, uh, almost four thirds. So the diameter of the large graph is not one. Okay, let me, so uh, I will spend the talk today uh, explaining uh, how to, indicating how to prove this. Let me just make a remark that uh, it's not uh, too hard to convince yourself that this uh, uh, main theorem uh, follows uh, from considering uh, special cases where mm -hmm. lambda is, as in the figure, just one cycle, a single cycle, or uh, lambda is the following dumbbell graph. So it turns out that once you prove the theorem for these two cases of lambda, you can prove it for uh, any lambda. So for example, uh, if you want to deduce the case of such a graph, lambda, from the following uh, two cases, you can just use the uh, second case to prove that this has rational, this segment has rational length, this one, this one, and then you obtain the length of this edge as this plus this minus this divided by two. So you can get the lengths of all segments as 
rational combinations of uh, lambdas that are cycles or dumbbell graphs. It requires uh, some uh, case checking and a, a page of case checking, but it's not very difficult. So today we will focus on one of these two special cases. On, we will focus on the case of lambda, a cycle. So it turns out that it all goes back to the theorem of Dane from 1903. That's conveniently written in German. And it says the following, if a rectangle uh, with side lengths A and B is tiled by squares, then the proportion of A to B is a rational number. So you have uh, you have a rectangle, maybe there is some large square, small square medium square, etc. you're tidying the rectangle by finitely many squares, then the proportion of A to B has to be a rational number. And uh, I will give you a proof that's due to Hadwiger uh, with the presentation given in the book of Eigner and Ziegler, proofs from the book. So we extend the square sides. So we extend uh, vertically this square side, this one, the horizontal ones, etc., to cut the entire rectangle to small rectangles. We extend sides of squares. to cut the rectangle uh, into smaller rectangles. And let's call the side lengths of these smaller rectangles. Uh, suppose they are, say this is A1, A2, A3, these three lengths and the Horizontal lengths call them B1, B2, B3, etc. And now we need to do some linear algebra. That some students that survived their first linear algebra course with me were able to follow. So we take the vector space inside the real line, but over Q generated by all those AI uh, BJ. So we have these rectangles AI times BJ, and we use these side lengths to generate the vector space over Q. Let V inside R be the vector space over Q. generated or sp spanned by all those AI BJ. 
And now the proof will be by contradiction. So assume that the proportion of A to B is irrational. Then A and B are linearly independent in this vector space. So then there exists a linear functional F defined on this space with values in Q such that F of A is equal to 1 and F of B is equal to minus 1 because we can just arbitrarily uh, decide what are the values of A and B if, once they are linearly independent. And now a computation follows. There are two ways to compute what's f of a times f of b. Of course, the easiest way just to compute, to multiply 1 by minus 1 and get minus 1. And the other way is to remember that if I had denoted the side legs correctly, then A is the sum of AI and B is the sum of BJ. So this is F of A1 plus A2 plus etc. times F of B1 plus B2 plus etc. And uh, now using linearity, we can write that this is just the sum over i and j f of a i times f of bj. And now uh, we group again these elements. So for example, we group the three top rectangles into one. And uh, so the three small top rectangles have sides A1, B1. The second rectangle has sides A1, B2. And the third top rectangle has sides, sides F A1, B3. So these are the terms that come from the rectangles in the first square, rectangles in the first square. And then we group the other uh, terms accordingly. We again use linearity. Using linearity, this first uh, bunch of terms gives us f of a1 times f of b1 plus b2 plus B3, and then there are other groups. And now you see that both A1 and B1 plus B2 plus B3 are the side lengths of the first square, so they are equal. So these are both equal to the side length of a square. So whatever the value of the functional on that is, this is the square of the value of the functional. So this is uh, non-negative, and similarly for the other groups. So this is non-negative. On the other hand, it's equal to minus 1. So that's a contradiction, proving that actually the ratio of A to B had to be rational. Questions? Mm -hmm. A1 times B4, okay. Mm -hmm. 
B4 is somewhere here, so there had to be some square here. So A1 times B4 is a small rectangle that, okay, suppose there was some square here, we extended it here to get B4, so this is the rectangle A1 times B4. Okay, uh, now I'm ready to apply this to prove our main theorem. So, uh, I'm erasing the rectangle. Okay, so now I will indicate the proof of the main theorem in this particular case where lambda is just a cycle. So we have a cycle of diameter uh, one. It might be long cycle, but it has diameter uh, inside gamma uh, one. So. Okay, let's, let's do a figure. This will be our graph gamma. And inside it, there is lambda. And we can assume that the length of lambda is greater than two. It's at least two because the girth of gamma is two, but we want to, our goal is to prove that the length of the cycle is rational. So we can as well assume it is greater than two. So in this case, if you take two antipodal uh, points on the cycle, in the cycle they are at uh, length, at distance greater than one, so there's, there has to be some other path between them. So there are many points inside this uh, cycle such that there is some shortcut. so that the shortest path between x and y goes outside the uh, lambda, and these will be called uh, chords. So a chord uh, x, y, so this will be for a pair, say x, y is a pair of points on the cycle, so it's, it's a pair inside lambda squared. Uh, this is an edge path, this red one, uh, of length smaller than one. Only such shortcuts are of interest to us, the ones that are of length uh, smaller than one. Of course, they are required to go from x uh, to y, and we want them to immediately exit the cycle and from this end, from this side. And with first and last edges outside lambda. Maybe, okay, let me keep this figure for a moment. So, First of all, note that there is a unique chord. If there is a chord between X and Y, it's unique because if there was another chord, this would contradict the fact that the girth is two. If you had two paths shorter of length smaller than one between two points, this would create a small cycle. So for fixed X, Y, this chord is unique and is a shortest, indeed is a shortest path between X and Y. But the same is true if you take points close to X and close to Y. If you take point x prime, which is sufficiently close to x, I'll write this explicitly in a moment, and the point y prime that is very close to y, then also going along blue, red, and blue gives you a shortest path between x prime and y prime.
So for such points x prime and y prime, we will say that they use this chord. So a pair x prime, y prime inside lambda squared uses uh, the chord xy if a shortest uh, path inside gamma from x prime to y prime can be obtained as in the figure, can be obtained by concatenating uh, this first blue path, so a path x prime x inside lambda, the chord, the red chord xy, and finally uh, by going along a path y, y prime inside lambda. And note that if uh, we label the lengths of these blue and red paths by uh, s, t, and d, say if we require that the length of the uh, red path is equal to d, the blue s, and the, this blue t, then in this case, this condition of, uh, of using this chord, this happens if and only if the length of s plus d plus t is uh, smaller or equal to 1. Because if this happens, then indeed we have this uh, shortest, uh, shortest path. And there are two remarks two bullets to note. First of all, for every pair x prime, y prime, uh, such that the distance between these two points, the distance inside lambda is greater than one, so if you cannot join them by a shortest path inside lambda, uh, then such a pair needs to use a chord, uses a chord, and in fact, one can improve that by thinking a bit about it to all points also at exactly at distance one. And moreover, if the distance between these points x prime and y prime inside gamma is strictly smaller than one, then such a chord is unique. Such a chord is unique. So the second bullet follows from the, again from the fact that the girth of gamma is equal to 2. If there were two chords employed, then, then this would give a short cycle. And uh, these points that are far on the cycle have to use a chord because the diameter of lambda is equal to 1. So these two assumptions are used to get these two bullets. Any questions? Now, so, so we specified how the chords work, and now we'll use it, uh, plug this into Dane's theorem. Yes, so if this, is sh if this is small, then you see a short path between these two points, but this has to be a shortest uh, path, because it's, if there will be a shorter path, then you will get a small short cycle by, by con concatenating these paths. What if there's a shorter path like times? It's, you would still get a short cycle. If there is a shorter path anywhere, you would still get a cycle by concatenating this path and the possible other path. So if you have any locally embedded path then of length smaller than one, it has to be the shortest. Yeah, here for the moment we fix, and up to this point we fix x and y, and now we discuss a bit what happens. Uh, in the second bullet we discuss what happens 
we can only have non-uniqueness of chords if the distance between x prime and y prime is exactly one. If it's smaller than one, again, there has to be a unique chord because otherwise we would combine the two, the two paths using two distinct chords to a short cycle. More questions? Okay, so now finally we need to get the rectangle. And by the way, this time we will not use a rectangle, we will use a annulus. The proof of the of Dane's theorem doesn't change if we, if we replace a rectangle by an annulus. So I could as well write here uh, or uh, an annulus. It has the following form. The height uh, A and perimeter B. The proof would do the same. So if we have an annulus tiled by squares, still the proportion between A and B has to be a rational number. Okay, so now where the annulus comes from? It will live inside the product uh, of the cycle, inside the torus that's the product of lambda with itself. Let, let me draw first lambda. Well, yeah, I, I draw it as a square. I split the cycle into an interval. And vertically, it's uh, also lambda. And we take a subset here. So let this be the annulus uh, defined by the following equation. So we look at the pairs of points x prime, y prime, such that the distance inside lambda is not too small, it's at least one. So for example, we, rem we remove the diagonal because x prime and x prime are distance zero. So remove this entire diagonal but also we remove some neighborhood of the diagonal. So we go here up by one, and we remove this entire band, let me use color. So we remove this entire band of height one around the diagonal, so it's also here. And uh, what's left, this is called A. You see this is an annulus. Let's compute its size. So the sides of this annulus are, first of all, this is the length of uh, one side. It's just uh, square root of two times the length of lambda. So the length of lambda times square root of two times what's the height of this annulus. If we didn't remove the band, it would be that. So it would be uh, lambda times square root of two divided by two. But uh, we remove the band, it has here height uh, square root of two divided by two. We remove it from uh, uh, two sides, so we have, have to subtract square root of two. So this is, these are the dimensions of, of the annulus, and you see that the difference, the, what, this side involves the length of lambda, this side involves the length of lambda minus a rational multiple of square root of two. So now let's uh, look at the particular chord. So let's pick a point, x, y, that such that x and y are endpoints of a chord. And then let's look how geometrically looks the set of points x prime, y prime using a particular chord 
x, y. Remember the equation is that the s, which is the horizontal distance, uh, horizontal difference between the coordinates, and t, which is the vertical difference between the coordinates, is smaller or equal than 1 minus d. So the equation s pl plus t is smaller or equal than 1 minus d. So this means that we are allowed to go 1 minus d upwards or 1 minus d left, or we can go a bit upwards and a bit left, but the whole set of points x prime and y prime satisfying using this chord is exactly this ball in the L1 norm or this rotated square. So this is uh, the set of points using the chord is a square uh, ce centered at x, y. So now let's see what's written in the bullets. The bullets, the first bullet says that the entire rectangle A is covered by blue squares because every point uses a chord. So these squares cover entire A. And the second bullet says that as long as we are in the interior of the square, we are not in the interior of another square. So these squares might touch only at the boundary. So this square style is rectangle A. So by the bullets, these squares tile A. So by Dane's theorem, we know that the proportion of the side lengths uh, of the height and of the perimeter of the annulus is rational, so, so we get that lambda over 2 minus 1 divided by lambda. This is a rational number. I just divided out the square root of 2. But then you see lambda over lambda is rational, so it just boils down to saying that the length of lambda is rational. So this finishes the proof of this special case of uh, the, the theorem with uh, Sergei and Damian. If you have a graph of gear 2 and uh, you look at a cycle uh, inside of diameter 1 in the, in the graph, then using Dane's theorem and tiling this particular analysis by the squares coming from pairs using a particular chord, you can prove that the length of the cycle is rational. And then much more hassle is required to prove that the middle segment of the dumbbell graph has also rational length, and then these piece together to prove the main theorem. So happy birthday, Victor, and uh, thank you for your attention. Okay, questions? Can you say a few words on the motivation of uh, studying this kind of subgraph? Yes, I will say a few words, and also I can refer to the previous recording of mine in Auditorium 1 two years ago, where I end at this point and I am out of time, and so this I am making up today now for it. So uh, we wanted, uh, we have a theorem with Damian that a finitely generated torsion group, if it acts on a cut zero, uh, two-dimensional cut zero complex, then it has a fixed point. And in order to do it, we need to understand a bit the local geometry, to classify what can be the local geometry of the complex. If all the angles there were rational, we could use tricks using billiards, because billiards and rational polygons are well understood. So we could use tricks coming from billiards. But uh, if the angles were not rational, the only way we could uh, go ahead is to find some geodesics of rank one. But for this, we needed to have diameter of a particular subgraph greater than one. So we are stuck a situation, uh, we are stuck at a situation where there are some irrational angles in the, uh, in, the, in the complex, which give rise to these irrational length segments in the length. But the, uh, this, this uh, lambda is of diameter exactly one. 
So this was the last case we needed to consider. And then uh, luckily we discussed with Sergey and uh, he was able to give us the link to Dane's problem and then figure out a way to gen even, Sergey figured out a way to uh, generalize the proof of Dane's theorem to work also in the case of this dumbbell graph. Further question? Okay, if not, we will uh, thank Piotr again and, and then we start immediately. <laughs>